to this panel specifically on hop creep. We're going to discuss hop creep in sort of all of its formats, ways to address it, different pieces of research that are currently being done on it, and ways that we can help mitigate it in the future and help you make better beer. I'm joined by a brilliant panel here today, uh, Dr. Thomas Shellhammer, Adam Beecham, and Robert Ring. And we're going to be uh, discussing various aspects of hop creep and uh, practical tips for how brewers can, can uh, use current research to mitigate hop creep in their own breweries. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Dr. Shellhammer is the Norwester Professor of Fermentation Science in the Department of Food Science and Technology at Oregon State University. He's an internationally recognized expert in hops, chemistry, and brewing science, and his lab investigates hops, beer quality, and the origins of hop aroma and flavor in beer. He teaches undergraduate and continuing education courses pertaining to brewing science and beer quality. He's published over 100 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and technical reports, and patents, and delivered over 300 professional presentations on five different continents. He served as the president of the board of directors of the American Society of Brewing Chemists, the president of the District Northwest Master Brewers Association, and he currently serves as the board of examiners on the IBD, or Institute of Brewing and Distilling. He's also a member of the Brewers Association Quality Subcommittee. We're also joined by Adam Beecham of Creature Comforts Brewing Company in Athens, Georgia. He is the chief operating officer and one of the co-founders of the company. Uh, Beecham is a UGA or University of Georgia alumnus. And in 2006, he left a PhD program in genetics uh, and molecular biology at Emory to pursue his passion and, and dream of opening a craft brewery uh, in Georgia. He served as a brewer at Sweetwater Brewing Company in Atlanta for seven years before making the dream a reality at Creature Comforts, which has uh, been in existence and making great beer since 2014. And finally, Rob Ring, last but not least. Uh, Rob uh, is a laboratory research technician with Yakima Chief Hops. Prior to YCH, he worked with, uh, in hops and hemp analytics uh, in various analytical laboratories. He holds a Bachelor of Science uh, in Chemistry from Central Washington University where he worked as an undergraduate research assistant in environmental chem chemistry. Rob is from Yakima, Washington, and is someone I get to work alongside on a day-to-day -day basis here. My name is Spencer Tilkemeyer. I work in uh, the Brewing Innovations Department here at Yakima Chief. I'm a brewer of, of a number of years uh, prior to working with YCH, and I'm proud to moderate this panel today of some uh, bright minds. So with that, we'll get right into it. So uh, just to set the stage here and offer a little bit of a primer on hop creep and what we're talking about today for those that are a little unfamiliar. Hop creep is essentially refermentation. Uh, it's colloquial, colloquially qual called hop creep, but essentially it's a second fermentation induced by dry hopping. Um, hop creep has become a major issue over the past uh, certain, you know, call it five years for a lot of breweries around the world. And, uh, a lot of that is uh, kind of coincides with the advent of really high dry hopping rates. How it happens um, at this point, uh, it is thought that at least uh, four enzymes are responsible for inducing hop creep. I say at least because there's a fair possibility that it could be a number of others that are also a, a, um, contributing to that. Um, at this point, alpha amylase, beta amylase, amyloglucidase, and limit dextrinase are thought to contribute to hop creep all in individual ways. And uh, the enzymes present in hops are generally thought to be responsible for this. In hot side additions, they are generally going to be denatured and killed by the higher temperatures of the, uh, of the hot side processes, where they typically become problematic and more noticeable for brewers is on the cold side where those enzymes are able to act upon sugars that are still present in the wort stream and further convert them into fermentable sugars. Um, the reason why this is problematic for a lot of brewers is that it can continue to ferment beer beyond its spec. It can make beer stronger than it's supposed to be. It can make it drier than it's supposed to be. It can also cause problems downstream uh, in packaging if it's not caught and addressed early to where it's allowed to ferment out, which can cause um, overcarbonated beer and sometimes even exploding packages, which is obviously very prob problematic. One of the questions we often get is, is this a recent phenomenon? And in fact, it is not. Uh, it was originally mentioned in 1893 in an English brewing paper um, that called, uh, called attention to the uh, freshening power of, of hops, which was essentially uh, describing the phenomenon that we we're talking about here, which is the, the possibility of actually causing beer to ferment a little bit further and dry out as a result of adding hops to, to cold beer. And we often also are asked, uh, why am I only now experiencing this, right? And some, some brewers do ask us that from time to time. 
that's ultimately, I think, one of the things that we're here to address today, to talk about those sort of phenomenons. But I think it can be attributed to a number of different things, um, one of which is just significantly increased dry hopping rates. Brewers dry hop at massively higher rates than they have in previous years in the past. Tom, I know that you'll be able to speak to this to, to a good extent. Um, some also think that potentially lowered hop kiln temperatures, uh, improvements in grower practice, um, wort compositions, you know, in New England IPAs have a lot of dextrins hanging out in them that um, other beer styles might not have had in the past. So a whole host of features, but I won't get too far into that. I'll actually leave that to you guys who are uh, experts in these fields. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll start with Tom. Tom, uh, you've been involved in hop research of all types for a lot of years now, aromatic research, um, grower practice, you work directly with all sorts of growers here throughout the valley. As it specifically pertains to hop creep, you actually presented at last year's Craft Brewers Conference and um, you gave a whole host of, of um, details on the research you've been pursuing. I, would, I guess my first question is, it, has anything changed since then? We've had a whole year since then. Yeah. You have a whole year to theoretically to learn more things, to, <laughs> to talk about it more, to work with growers more. What's been on your mind when it comes to hop creep lately? Oh man. Um, so you know, your introduction was great in terms of like, why are we here with all, um, all this hop creep? Mm -hmm. And so the, the New England IPA, I think is something that is really, really what's making this in the forefront of people's minds. And so uh, what's happened in, when, after that talk that we gave together in, at mm -hmm. CBC, CBC Online, mm -hmm. um, thank you, COVID. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, we've been continuing to work in the area, tying it in with um, stuff we're doing on regional identity and terroir. Mm -hmm. So looking at different farming practices. And uh, so there's some cool stuff uh, that's going on in there. Um, and so the, the project, like the terroir project specifically, is looking at do, does, where hops grown, where hops are grown, does that influence the the qualities that you'd find in hops. So the concept of terroir, like with wine grapes, is pretty well known. So we're looking at, does it apply to, to hops? And part of what we're doing along the side there is like, well, does terroir regional differences influence enzyme activity? Mm -hmm. So is it where they're grown? Uh, is it uh, management practices? Um, we're trying to sort of decouple that with the terroir study. We wanted to find out what's happening actually at the place, not how growers are, are influencing um, quality um, things like maturity and whatnot. So that one offered some really interesting um, insight that there are differences. Like when we look at within a particular field, uh, like if this table is a field of hops and we look at different spots on that field to understand what's, what's happening in terms of like differences in soil, we can also see what happens in terms of differences of chemistry. There's differences we clearly can see spatially within a given field and certainly between fields. And, um, and those differences within the field, in many cases, are of the same order of magnitude as the differences between fields, right? So, and that is not unsurprising if you've got a field that has different kinds of soil composition or a different slope and different degrees of water holding capacity. So that was kind of an interesting thing to see, is that like when looking across five different fields of Simcoe, we can see that the differences within those fields are like so, and the differences between the fields are like so. And so it was interesting to see that, yeah, there are differences that we can attribute to region or a different place. But, but looking at different samples within those fields, we see there's differences with, within that field as well. And so that's, you know, and as we have this conversation, you'll hear more and more about like, we're trying to get a hands on how much differences are there. And what that kind of indirectly gets at is to why some brewers are like, hey, I, I have this problem happening with this batch of hops, but I don't have it happening with this batch of hops. Like the unpredictability part about it, I think is what's vexing to many brewers, yeah. is that like they have the, the process dialed in and it's like, oh, it's going, it's fine, it's fine. Or it's, it's ha creep is happening, creep is happening, all of a sudden it stops or it happens way too much. And, uh, and you know, from a time through the cellar, that's a real headache. And then, then like the, the, in not all cases, but in some cases, the post dry hop induced diacetyl spike and that even further reduction of that creates, I think, for some, many brewers an even bigger headache yeah, than, than the fact that the beer dries out more because you can kind of deal with that and maybe adjust for it and blend it. But if the beer is supposed to be spending 10 days or 14 days in the cellar and it's spending 28 days in the cellar, then that really screws things up upstream. So long story short, the differences that we're seeing is that, oh, hey, this is like, this is, it's variable. It's variable depending upon variety. Although we don't have enough data yet to know, is it really driven by any particular variety? And I think like that study I'm just telling you about with looking at five different fields of 
Simcoe, and we got five different samples within each field of Simcoe. So we got like a 25 data points. We can see that there's a fair amount of variation within the field as there is between the field. And then you take all that lump that together and compare that to say another variety like Cascade or Mosaic. You need to gather, we will need to gather a fair amount of data in order to understand that. And then layered on that is things like kilning and, and mm -hmm. maturity, which we can talk about in general. So that was a long answer. <clears throat> it's it, perfect. An answer to your, your question. That's perfect. But that's kind of what's on our mind right now is like, oh yeah, as we, as we, Maybe one part of the lab is working on kilning, another part of the lab is working on, on regional differences, another part of the lab is working actually on hop creep, like how do we, can we control it in the, in the brewery? And they're all kind of weaving together. And, and, and that's the cool thing about science, right? You, st you start studying and it you more, more 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 and more questions, yeah. right? <laughs> you answer some, you're like, that's satisfying. But then like, Ooh, there's like all these other things that are happening there, so. Yeah, as I, I, if I can, if I can, uh, say it's a uh, the answer seems like it's it's more complicated than we expected and and continues to be so more yeah, the more I you peel back the onion, onion. Exactly. Yep. Yep. so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a uh, i think it, it brings up a, a point too that we talk about frequently in, like internally because we we talk about this ultimately our job is to solve problems for brewers to make their lives easier to make growers lives easier right yeah. so rob one of the things that we're going to talk about in a moment is rob's analysis method that he's developed which is even if we can't like, so this, st this study that you're pioneering right now sounds amazing, right? Because you're gonna be able to talk about the different ways that a hop creep is affecting even different parts of a field. I'm worried about the brewer audience right now who are hearing that and they're saying, oh my God, I'll never have a handle on hop creep, right? Yeah, exactly. And so for us, I think it comes down to like, before we try to uh, think about the, the idea of solving hop creep, right? Like if you were viewing it as like a disease, one thing that we could start with is if can we measure it, right? And that's like that's step one. And if we can measure it, then we can start to get a better sense of, like what you're talking about, where different fields or different grower practice, different kilning techniques could potentially you know have a large effect on that. And so um, anyway, we will touch about on that in just a minute, a little it's bit more. All different, all different ways to measure it, right? Right. So you measure it in terms of finished gravity or ABV or you know bells are doing some interesting stuff, looking at amount of CO2 produced. So you can look at it in terms of like in a, in a package. Um, and then, we, and then I know you're working on a diastase activity uh, method, and we've got one in the lab that does the same sort of thing, but that requires liquid chromatography. So there's a number of different ways to kind of view it yeah. and try to kind of get, get a handle on it and understand it yeah. before you solve it. For sure, and it's a, it is a complicated topic for sure with a lot of, likely a lot of inputs, you know, so. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, uh, that brings us to our other CBC participant from last year. You also spoke on the same panel with Dr. Shellhammer. Several times. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you've, um, you, I guess, probably the same. Worthy to ask you the same question. You you spoke a lot more about mm. practical brewing elements, right? How you guys have tackled it at Creature Comforts, the kind of the the multi pronged approach that you've taken to make sure that it's not a, like a crippling issue in a brewery. I know, and for a lot of brewers, it can be borderline that at times. So maybe for you, without making you rehash all that, like what's What's working? What's changed since then? Have you guys learned it and gained any new insights over the past year since then? Yeah, um, we have, you know, we have uh, learned a good amount, I'd say, but, um, you know, the brewery is not a lab for sure. So you can't, you, you can't always pick out variables when you're, you know, having to produce these beers and, you know, getting the opportunity to produce the same beer over and over and over again can, you know, ideally should be, you know, replicable. Um, but usually you get into a groove with that beer eventually and then you have this problem people want limited release beers so there's always a challenge of this new beer is coming out and really have no idea how it's going to behave in the fermenter so um, that really presents to us the greatest opportunity to continue to you know either try to predict or just have all of the tools ready to respond in the appropriate ways um, we have thought about it, you know, as uh, sort of like a moving target or multiple moving targets that you're trying to all get to align. So you want to hit your finishing gravity, you want to hit your ABV, which are tied, but then you also need to hit your VDK spec all at the same time. And at some point, all of those are going to align and you pull the trigger to cold crash the beer. <laughs> That's when you freeze it. But sometimes they don't align. Sometimes the VDK wants to hang up here forever and ever and ever. And meanwhile, you're losing your FG and you're gaining ABV and the spear is getting further and further away. And maybe the VDK is never going to come down. What are you going to do? So that's what I find when brewers just kind of throw up their arms and they're like, this is such a problem that we don't have the tools to deal with. So um, essentially uh, what we've done is to look at, you know, the, the 
control points that we have. So like healthy yeast, I think is the number one thing. If you don't really, really know that your yeast is very healthy, um, you should take a look there first. Um, healthy yeast is gonna reuptake diacetyl and, and BDK faster. And that's a key thing. The other thing and you this can- This is really around diacetyl reduction, right? Yeah. Because the creep's gonna mm -hmm. happen regardless of yep. your yeast health. It's, ha yeah. Uh, it's that. It's, it's just gonna hang up there. If, it's, right. if the yeast is gonna eat some very simple sugars as it comes out of mm -hmm. maltose, it's gonna do it. It's gonna leak diacetyl or, or the precursor out into the, into the beer and you know, it's gonna, unless you have ALDC, that's gonna build up into diacetyl and cause off flavors. So, um, you know, the ALDC, the enzyme alpha, uh, what's the alpha acetolactate decarboxylase, I think I said that right, um, is, uh, it's like a peak shaving almost, like you still get a diacetyl peak, but it's mm -hmm. gonna, it's gonna be less. So when I'm talking about like a bunch of moving targets, like slowing down the evolution or the development of diacetyl has been a new thing. So we've been thinking about feeding dry hops perhaps like slowly or starting to do it a little bit earlier, which Tom's been talking about for years. Um, but if, you know, what if we could dry hop over three days and sort of give the yeast this trickle of food mm -hmm. um, and allow it to sort of maintain, you know, let some diacetyl out, take some back in and sort of thread the needle a little bit like that. Um, you can do a lot of things to slow that down. You can cool your temperature of your dry hop. I don't really like colder dry hop beers personally. They, they kind of uh, hold in some more vegetal arona, aromas that I'm not a fan of, but it definitely works uh, in terms of really slowing that diacetyl production. Um, we, you can reduce your cell count um, in your tank, which actually slows the whole thing down a good bit. And maybe you never get that spike um, of VDK. It's kind of critical to understand me for me that you're always going to be developing sugars like forever and ever. Like Tom's lab showed that really clearly. Even once you get the hop material out of there, you're still going to be developing fermentables. So it's not really, I mean, most of it happens right away. Um, and that's, that's important because that gives the yeast this big glut of food, it starts to eat. But if you can make, if you can slow that down, maybe you shave your, your diastole curve a little mm -hmm. bit and you can, those targets start to align and you can cold crash the beer. Um, so that's just a new sort of way that I've been thinking about it is like, you need all these things to align in order for you to move on to the next step. You need to be watching all those things for more amateur brewers. Like you should be smelling for diacetyl before you take that cold crashing step. So, um, you know, some newer things, I think, it's really interesting to me that some yeast produces significantly less BDK in these situations. Um, there's a guy named James Brewer that works at our brewery now um, who has some unpublished work that shows like really wild variation in the amount of uh, VDK produced uh, based on strain and a really controlled uh, fermentation, like a laboratory scale fermentation. Mm -hmm. um, some yeasts, um, I don't wanna throw a bunch of yeast under the bus, but there are some yeast that we don't use anymore because they just, inherently are going to be worse in those situations. There's a cold yeast that I'm really excited about. We haven't played around with in a hazy IPA yet, but in James's study, it never went above threshold for the entire length of this mm -hmm. 10 gram per liter dry hop, which is a pretty significant dry mm -hmm. hop. So i um, been hearing about acidification at dry hop, you know, maybe that allows, um, you know, that hinders the hop enzymes a little bit. I don't know. That's mm -hmm. no, you don't no, think so? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I don't know why we, people are doing it. We though. tried some bench yeah. trials with that. Well, yeah. you see like, as you put more and more hops in, you see yeah. the pH going up. So people yeah. think, okay, maybe put it back down. as you move pH up, this yeah. is really accentuating the enzyme activity. So let's just titrate it back down. Yeah. And so we did some just simple bench type trials yeah. to see if we could do that. And, and we, we, we could certainly bring the, the pH down, mm. but it was like, eh, we're still getting Okay. Creep. It's not. Really? It, it was not like a shutdown. It's just Maybe from current. like a palate um, perspective, like bringing the pH because you know IPAs should be. Maybe not should be, but it's like in the range of let's say four, four to I don't know four six maybe. Yeah. maybe. Maybe a little lower, but we've seen some beers that are like four eight, maybe even five zero. Oh. Yeah, and so that's yeah it's way up there. Yeah. Way up there, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. So. From a flavor perspective, maybe you would you would do that, but no, if it I doesn't mean, really, yeah, not enough that we would say, oh, yeah, here, let's, let's, you know. So I, I think I've had this thought that like, I mean, most hops have, I mean, every hop has some baseline level of activity, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once you concentrate it up to five pounds per barrel, like a lot of these hazy IPAs are, yeah. 
no matter what you hop it with, it's going to have some creep, you know, really, there's not a whole lot of ways around that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it becomes a mitigation strategy unless we talk about, you know, baking our hops or, or cooking our beers or what have you. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of things are still bouncing around my head on this. Like I, I will say the brewery's in a place where we, um, no longer have major headaches associated with it. Just healthy yeast, using ALDC appropriately and watching that diacetyl number really closely and knowing when we can't cold crash. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, a new beer can throw you for a loop for sure still every now and then. Yeah. So do you control yeast cell count? Like do you? Uh, we have experimented with it. So um, we- Centrifuge into a certain- Yeah, I got, I got a tip density. from another brewery to uh, take it down to between five million and two and a half million cells per mil. Mm -hmm. And you still get your biotransformation and some interesting, you know, hop yeast interaction character, right. but uh, the creep is greatly mitigated. And uh, in the past, yeah, so that, that's a really good strategy. If you have a centrifuge, it works really well. It's a lot of work, you know, you lose some beer because of it, but um, we've done it successfully. Um, we have centrifuged onto dry hops many times and always hated the flavor of those beers. No, There's something really I mean, bizarre that happens. Yeah, it's, it's uh, always presents as a squashy, Gordy pumpkin kind of hmm. aroma, and I can't identify what it is. We thought it might be acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde. but it doesn't test higher than a control. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it's it's like the inside of a pumpkin, like when you're carving a jack o' lantern. It's oh, really man. bizarre. Yeah, it's crazy because yeah. that's kind of our, our quintessential like acid high acid We call yeah. it pumpkin guts. Really? So, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Emulsion paint for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Oh. It, it dovetails actually really specifically with some aromatic research, like not on the topic of hop creep at all, but like on on the same topic of aromatic and like where to deploy hops to deploy their maximum beneficial qualities and minimize their negative qualities, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we constantly <clears throat> see as an, as an anecdotal thing from brewers over and over is healthy yeast in the presence of hops tends to accentuate good things. I mean, speaking in extremely broad strokes right, here. Right. And diminishing unhealthy, like very kind of dead beer tends to retain bad things about hops, right? So I think maybe one of the takeaways for like to make your beers more aromatic and to help mitigate hop creep is yeast, yeast health is like paramount, right? Yeah. And I'm a huge advocate for making sure to introduce your hops the bulk of your hops at least when there's still some some ver some viable yeast present because i think what you just said is is a huge part of it we we experience that same pumpkin guts thing and yeah. particularly with certain yeast unfortunately they tend to be the more popular yeast in the industry and things like that and so um it's interesting how those things sort of mesh together right where it's like a healthy yeast creates this biome of good, of good stuff and the lack of that can be uh can be very troublesome yeah. down the road yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um and the sticks yeah. yeast handling is right. also something that brewers may or may not be considering i mean do you guys do you guys do a, a yeast dump before you dry hop oh yeah yeah always get as much as is reasonable out mm -hmm. prior mm -hmm. to dry hop so and we use a really highly flocculent um it's a wlp002 is, is creature comfort sort of house ale strain mm -hmm. it's what, one of the highest flocculators which is fantastic for us being able to pull yeast off early prior to a dry hop and continue to reuse it. But not fantastic um, for diacetyl reduction. No, actually, <laughs> it, is, it it usually crosses the finish line right on time. Oh, it's weird. Yeah. And you know, James's study actually they did all the statistics and found no correlation between flocculation and the VDK levels or the mm -hmm. amount of overall creep. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I, it it is a strong fermenter even when it's sitting down there in the cone. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. still some of it that's kind of floating around and. Um, so yeah, we always, we shave quite a lot during fermentation a couple times prior to dry mm -hmm. hop to get the mm -hmm. Truby stuff out. Yep. Um, we're finding that that reduces mercaptans for us. And then prior to dry hop, you know, as long as it looks like thick yeast, we'll, we'll continue to drop it. Um, once it starts to look I think which is really good from the yeah. standpoint of yeast mm -hmm. health, because mm -hmm. I, I think there's some anecdotal evidence that if you are dry hopping on top of lots of yeast and then you try to do a yeast harvest, well, when you have this huge hop inclusion yeah. in your <laughs> yeast, but also I think it negatively affects yeast health. Oh, big time, so yeah. then you can take that and you're going to pitch that into the next <clears throat> fermentation. Then you're you're already starting off on the wrong foot. Yeah. So yeah, we would we never repitch anything that's got hops in the, in the dry mm -hmm. hop. I mm -hmm. just you know just told if early on as a brewer just don't do that. Yeah. Um, that's a good advice. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get as much out as you can, but not you know don't centrifuge it all out. That's kind of that's right. Important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's compelling, and I think it, it like I say, it, it is a complex thing. I, it's a when we talk to brewers a lot, we we frequently get questions about hop creep, and one of the things that I encourage them is like, 
don't get too fixi fixated upon the smoking gun, right? It, generally speaking, there's more than one. So like yeah. start to start with some basics, right? Which is yeast health and, uh, and making sure that diacetyl is a regular part of your regimen and everything like that, diacetyl checks and all. And um, chances are it's not a, like I say, not to dive back into this analogy, but a disease that we're going to cure like right off the bat, it's something that we can manage the symptoms and mm -hmm. usually very well actually if the brewery can develop a pretty, a pretty solid regimen for doing so. But um, Healthy yeast is gonna pay droves of benefits anyway yeah. you know if you're yeah. if you're not looking at viabilities i mean viability is not the whole story either you know like yeah. you can have 92 93 94 percent yeast that just is out of glycogen and is about to die right so we just looked at zinc aeration uh handling practices and harvest time and then pitch rate really is kind of the big hitters for us yeah so, yeah well very good that's <clears throat> that's a lot to to digest but i think the, 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 the main point is, is very sound for any brewer of any size, which is like your health, a healthy yeast makes a healthy brewery. And so, well, Rob, we haven't heard from you much yet. And uh, I think you've got a pretty, uh, not just pretty compelling, very compelling uh, research method that you've been working on that I think not, not everybody in the audience is gonna be super, um, I would guess, lab savvy or having worked in, you know, around an HPLC or something like that. But I think the practical, takeaways from the method that you've been working on right now are pretty huge for the industry, especially the implications of where it could go from here. So before we get into that, maybe you'll just give like a quick primer on the method that you've been working on and what it's intended to do. Yeah, sure. So uh, we developed a method to try and sort of predict or quantify the potential for hop creep in the hops, uh, just in the hops themselves before they're ever added to beer. So uh, we adapted it from an ASBC method for malt diastatic power. And basically we do a, a digest of ground hops in a soluble starch solution. Um, we just put them, you know, it's really pretty simple, but tedious. We put ground hops into these, you know, screw top bottles with this starch solution, put them on a shaker, room temp, and, um, uh, shake them 90 minutes, and then they will produce, uh, you know, the action of those diastatic enzymes on the starch. You'll produce uh, maltose, mainly maltose, and other, you know, um, theoretically some glucose, and then a bunch of dextrins of different sizes. But what we've seen is that maltose is really significant um, from this method. And so then... Um, it was a matter of doing this for, you know, a large number of harvest samples and kind of seeing some trends and then trying to refine this to the point where we can implement this as like a quality control metric. And this could be something that, you know, in the long term, uh, like the ultimate goal, uh, we make this something that goes on like every C of A. Like here is the hop creep potential or diastatic activity, if we want to call it that, and um, basically let brewers make a decision um, when they see that lot analysis, or and you know help inform what they're going to do with that product. I, yeah, I think it's brilliant. That's an awesome summary too. And I think for you, you chalked it up to like the practical takeaway for brewers, right? Which is like it's great to have a, a, an analysis method where we can measure these things and you know, all the research that you're doing right now, it's one of those things where like, um, it's hard to pinpoint what's going on unless we can measure hop creep. But our job, right, working for Yakima Chief Hops, when we work with brewers every day is to help solve problems, right? Help solve problems for growers and brewers, right? And if we're able to measure it and we're able to put it on a C of A, it becomes another quality and a quality metric for brewers, right? That they examine as they're working with vendors, as they're asking, you know, for certain lots of hops and things like that. Ultimately, it helps them predict what's about to happen. That's like the main takeaway, right? That they, they know what they're up against, right? Even if we can't solve hop creep from, from and maybe someday we will by, by being able to measure it, maybe someday we will be able to nail down that smoking gun. But until that point, brewers at least, will at least know what they're about to engage in as they dump a bag of hops into the fermenter. Um, yeah. And that's huge, you know? Or not into the fermenter. Or not into the fermenter, right? Direct it to like the whirlpool. To the hot side, right, right. exactly. exactly. Right. So it's like what? Can... <laughs> yeah, what are hot side hops? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rob, I think the poster that you presented at the ASBC conference um, earlier this year had some really interesting findings, and maybe you can touch upon that for a minute. I, I know that sure. what we saw is that there's a huge host of factors that contributed to where a variety or where a certain lot of hops 
um, showed up on the scale, and maybe you could just highlight some key points from that? Yeah, sure. So, so we did uh, about 700 samples uh, from that harvest, um, broke them down by variety, and you know, put them all in like a box plot. And basically, we found that there was this really big varietal effect. So, one of the things that was really interesting is that, like, there was this um, sort of anecdotal evidence that there was this strong varietal effect. And, you know, some, there were some literature results out there saying that this was the case. And so, putting this together and seeing how it shook out, it was really like, oh, this is, you know, this is really legit. Like, Cascade is way at the top. Like, Cascade is, just stands out in terms of maltose production. Um, Citra, way down at the bottom. And we're talking about, so, uh, about 400 ppm of maltose produced was the average for Citra versus 1600 for Cascade. So that's just, that's giving you a sense of the magnitude here. And then um, in between that, you know, you have a whole range um, by variety. So that was really cool to see. Um, we also, we did just a really basic experiment doing uh, seed, seeds dosed into hops. So I basically took like, um, I took a lot of, I think, CTZ, um, just a really mid-range uh, hop creep or maltose one. And uh, I just did like a one, two, three, five, and 10% by weight addition of uh, seed. And what, we, what I saw is that it was by, uh, by replacing like 10% of the content of the hops with seed material, it basically tripled the maltose produced. And so that's something that we, it wasn't a surprise. This was something that was pretty well understood that uh, diastatic enzymes are gonna be concentrated in the seeds. The seeds ground, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, ground up, yeah. So we actually collected them um, off the pelleting line and then I just ground them up and uh, yeah, cool. added them into the ground hops. Yeah, and so that's, that, was, that was cool to see. Uh, just to give a primer for those kind of watching that aren't as maybe involved in, in kind of hop production and everything like that, seeds are a quality control metric uh, that's actually managed by the USDA and it's something that every hop grower is expected to adhere to. Seeds are essentially considered dead weight almost in a bale. They're, they're not hops and they're not what you're paying for. So it is a, something that we tightly manage. And all vendors should have a really tight seed spec. That's something that we actually actively spend months and months of the year in the field roguing males to make sure that they don't uh, end up in bales. Um, so if anything, this is just another feather in the cap of make sure that the fields are roguing properly and that, there's, and that seed is getting out of the fields because ultimately not only are they not contributing from an aromatics perspective, they are also potentially contributing from a hop creep perspective. So all the more reason to uh, make sure that the hops that you're using um, are of high quality and are, that the seeds are being controlled because that's a, it's a significant factor for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So Obviously 10% Seed right. content is not something. Ten percent seed content would never make it to your doorstep. Yeah. Let me it's just say that right, right, right off the, the, the one to two percent. Is yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. still, the fact that it that it has a yeah. pretty significant lever. Threefold. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, it's amazing. I think that that um, just the method itself makes me very excited because uh, I'm a former brewer. I'm still an, always in the brewer's headspace, right? That's like, it's just my natural native headspace, and so to me, um, a research bit is only as, uh, with all due respect, only as useful as I can make it practical for a brewer, right? That's what yeah. makes it tick, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the C of A is a kind of a historical vestige for us, right? The existing C of A has a lot, of, a lot more to do with like helping understand varietal purity and like making sure that the lab who's an analyzing can verify that like this cascade is actually cascade and it's not something wildly different or a rogue field or something. It's not the most practical document for brewers. It's like, it, it is something that we strive to make more practical all the time. And I think as we start to examine, you know, these ways that we could potentially make additions to the C of A into the future, it has a host of, of like implications for a brewer that can help inform their, their brewing decision making in a, in a large number of ways. We've talked about this with survivables and sort of beer soluble compounds as well, mm -hmm. which is how can we make that a more practical piece of advice that's located on a C of A. 
rather than focusing on myrcene and humulene and these other things that may or may not be as useful or important. So, um, um, well, I think, so we've, we've got a good amount of like expertise from each of your individual areas. I would say, um, what do you each see, maybe Tom, you start us off, as what's next from a research standpoint, or what's next on the horizon as it relates to hop creep? But you've talked about field, you know, uh, terroir and field analysis mm -hmm. and things like that, but what, what do you see as the next step for you and your lab and, and the industry even? So we're doing a fair amount of work now on hop kilning and its influence mm -hmm. on hop flavor. Uh, and alongside of that is, is looking at hop uh, enzyme potential. And there's a clear relationship between kilning temperature and the amount of enzyme that's left behind in the, in the hops. So I think we're gonna be probing that for another two seasons. We've got uh, research going lined up for this fall, this coming harvest year, and we'll do it again in, in 2020, mixed in with some sort of sustainability energy measurement. Mm -hmm. But temperature is clearly having an effect. That's the lever that the grower can pull that would have an impact on that. Um, and then we're also exploring things that happen within the brewery, like are there, are there treatments that brewers can do that can help control this or potentially even stop it. So and that's, that's kind of the space we're working in. It's like the, the terroir stuff and the killing stuff has been driven more about hop flavor and the, the hop creep stuff has been kind of sidelined to that. That's mm -hmm. not, but it's just like, it's a parallel project and it helps us understand more about the phenomenon, but it doesn't necessarily give us immediate tools. Mm -hmm. Like we know that, not know, but we suspect that maturity has an impact mm -hmm. that later harvested hops um, actually have lower hop creep, which is kind of interesting, but there is clearly a maturity effect. Um, and we know that killing has an effect, we know that growing has an effect, but these are like sort of intangible things for the brewer to deal with, right? It's all on the grower side and it's leading to the variability. So we're trying to turn our attention to the grower, not the, uh, the brewer side, like what, is, what can the brewer do? And are there enzymatic treatments? Uh, not, I don't think there's enzymatic treatments that you can use that can really solve this. Uh, we talked a little bit about acidification, mm. but you know, hop timing, yeast health, and then other potential treatments that, that brewers might be able to, to use. So, I'm gonna throw the dirty pasteurization P word out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's fascinating that, I mean, yeah, the, you're developing sugar for years. Like, you know, it's gonna continue to put these mm -hmm. fermentable sugars mm -hmm. out, which is dramatically changing the. I don't know, everything about your beer, really the basis of it. So we've been zeroed in, zero focused on shelf stability for the past year and a half or so. And we're trying well, anything we can get our hands on. We do you know, little additive tests, things like sulfites or chelators or uh, amino acids, things that are you know in the literature. And we're like, oh, let's try. We'll add a little bit to a can or through the filler and then so, age it you know, against it. And you know, we've done things like try to control hot side aeration by purging vessels with CO2. But, um, you know, and, and really thinking and diving it back into hop creep and thinking about this talk, I was just thinking about, well, what about these sugars that we're just developing like for forever in this package? Like if we could just control that, which is, you know, sort of the oldest, you know, modern brewing technology, we should try it, you know, should we, yeah, should, yeah, should, yeah, we, yeah, should okay. we be opposed to it really? Yeah. If it makes a better, I, I'm interested to at least try it. Yeah. in our brewery um, to see what that does because we i mean it's an incredibly unstable product um and you know we we say like about if you warm store our beer about 30 days or so right now like we would say that's not worth um, selling to someone so um you know that's a real world that's a reality that we have to There's deal dollars with behind you that know, exactly. yeah for sure yeah. you know we have a cold supply chain but like you know if something gets to a gas station in north georgia for us like that could definitely happen. So I'm mm -hmm. um, curious, you know, it's tangential to hop creep, but would pausing, you know, perhaps pausing the development of those sugars have an impact on shelf stability? Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think it's fascinating too, because we've all worked so hard beer wise, uh, vendor wise, grower wise to keep everything cold for so long. Right. And like, and then Tom, you're pointing, you're saying that there's a direct effect, right? Like right. hotter kiln temperatures are, are, are lowering these things. And we've all worked as an industry. We've all, had this like sort of communal, communal consciousness, right? right? To, tr to try to bring, the bring these temperatures down. Same thing with us in the pellet mills, right? Mm -hmm. We are constantly trying to keep our pellet temperatures lower and lower and lower to the point at this point where they're the lowest they've ever been, right? And, uh, but that's, you know, that's uh, maybe deleterious when it comes to hop creep, but would anybody have us go backwards? And that's hopefully what you're yeah, able to, exactly, <laughs> that's right. what you're have, able to hopefully help us yeah, answer at right, some point. We are not like champion 
turn the heat up. Turn the heat up, right? Yeah, but it's, but like, it's like understanding, like, a, to what degree, like, if you are going to play with temperature in the kiln, what to what degree does it have an impact on hot pulley? Right. Uh, and then, and then, in, and the brewery, like, are there things that you can do in the brewery? We talked a little bit about pasteurization. Mm -hmm. So on that, that panel that we were on together, we had Keelan, Keelan Vaughn from uh, Stone and Wood, and. So they pasteurize their beer, their, their Pacific Ale, which is yeah. kind of they're kind of the standard bearer of that style in, in Australia, and they tackle this with pasteurization. Yeah, and so that's you know that helps them sleep at night at night in terms of ensuring um, beer quality. So that's an approach from a, a, a brewing perspective, although that's a bit of a challenge for many craft brewers because yeah. there's a serious capital investment in terms of going to pasteurization, and then there's also philosophical you know identity around whether you want to pasteurize or not. Mm -hmm. Right, but there's also potentially you know looking at pasteurizing hops. So yeah, we yeah. Did some bench top trials looking at can we and we can certainly can affect that by doing you know, on the bench in different increasing amounts of temperature in in hops will actually reduce these effects. Mm -hmm. So, so that's another possibility is maybe there's a, a step there that you could actually pre-treat hops. Yeah. So and that's kind of you know what's next on the on the horizon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Rob, how about you? You spent a, a year of your life uh, in, of front of, in front of a, 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 in front of an HPLC. Oh, uh, I, I had help. I had an intern, yeah, but for a, lot of a good part of that. But he's there's a lot. selling it though. He had a whole room and basically an entire COVID year devoted to uh, to being in front of an HPLC and a, and a grinder and a shaker and all that. HPLC year. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> yeah, so, I didn't even spend that much time in front of the the instrument. It was just the prep. Yeah, just prepping, yeah, letting the so instrument run on its own. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's uh, coming up again because harvest is on the way. So I'll be busy with that. But um, beyond that, uh, we, we've also, like, we've been reading what you guys have been putting out about uh, temperature effects. And um, we're going to try some, like, really small scale thermal stability stuff yeah. ourselves. Um, we have kind of like in the really long term, we're also looking at those questions about like uh, the agronomic practices and how they affect hop creep or the diastatic activity. And then even like, could, could we go the other way and could we measure diastatic activity in a hop and learn something useful by doing so? Something about like it's, you know, is, look at the maturity or um, like does this respond to stress like uh, does it respond to heat stress or water yeah, stuff like that like that that um, that regional identity project we were right. measuring disease pressure based indirectly based upon like the number of sprays that that growers were using so we could correlate that like if a field needed more sprays okay there's more fungal disease pressure and we saw some mm -hmm. really significant like linear relationships between wow. disease pressure and hop creep. Interesting, in like the negative direction, like the fields that tended to have more disease pressure, interestingly had less hop creep. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that kind of was an interesting thing <clears throat> because we don't really know whether these enzymes are in the hops or on the hops. Because right. mm -hmm. I have like my microbiologist right. tell me this is a this is you know fungal related. These are these are plant is actually producing these. Okay, maybe could be. And so to see the disease pressure part. Uh, having a negative impact, it was like, okay, well, there's certainly some sort of, okay, it's correlation, right? Maybe not causation, mm -hmm. but there's a correlation between, uh, and this is within just, uh, you know, fields of Simcoe, high disease pressure had low enzyme activity, um, low uh, fields had higher enzyme activity, and there could be other complicating things. You need to re replicate this, whether it's maturity or whatnot. But um, that kind of leads me to believe that it's not like a fungal issue. Like I would think that if there was it's more fungus plant. in the field, yeah. that then that's it. By attacking the disease, you would be able to uh, impact it. And you can, but it's kind of the other direction. Not I'm, Again, not promoting, let the fungal disease go wild. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, it kind of leads credence to the, the, the idea that it's probably more the plant mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. the microbiota that's on the plant. And uh, you don't really find a lot of microbiota on hops yeah. in general. Right. Like, yeah, you can find a little bit, but it's they're they're relatively low. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's um, these like these relationships you're talking about about you know how much nitrogen a grower applies or how many sprays, and these are things that I think will help inform growers in terms of it's another piece of information that allows them to make decisions. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's like the classic, every reaction has an equal and an opposite reaction, right? And so it's, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot internally is like, we all, I say communal consciousness, right? Because brewers, uh, craft brewers, we talk a lot, we all are kind of dialoguing all the mm -hmm. time. So we sort of make these decisions together. Any reaction we take is, has, has downstream implications for the brewer, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you take nothing away from today, make sure your yeast is healthy. That's the, that's the number yeah, one so practical yeast, takeaway so. today. But um, I just, I'm, um, I'm just feel so privileged to work in the industry and get to like continue to work with people like you guys who are pushing the, the frontier of that because hops taste way different than they used to, right? And there's like, and that's like a pretty recent phenomenon. Like they, they tasted pretty much the same for hundreds of years and now they taste like insanely different. And that's like the span of 10 to 20 years maybe, right? Well, not just the hops, the beers that are made from them. The beers, the like the processes. Are, exactly. It's, so it's a cool time to be a brewer. Big time, yeah. Mm -hmm. good, it's good job security for people like you. Yeah, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a tremendous, uh, like, a tremendously complex topic, but one that I think is hopefully brewers don't feel just beaten down by. Hopefully there's actually an element of, of kind of like, you know, taking, taking the reins and actually driving, driving it for your own brewery. And I, I hope that we can help with that and that, you know, people like you can continue to push those frontiers for people. Um, any final thoughts or uh, things that you guys want to add for the, for the good of the industry before we close today? Maybe like uh, maybe consider like the Bob Ross approach to making uh, beer. Like mm -hmm. more is not necessarily always better. Careful, Tom. Right. You're talking about hops. I know exactly. <laughs> but, but there is like I think an optimal point, right, in terms of how much you can extract from the hop and how much beer losses you have and all these things. That yeah, maybe it's, it's counter to like trying to sell more hops. But no, I think that, that yeah. the American approach, to, in many cases, is like louder is better stronger is better more is better and i think that there is a sweet spot in terms of hopping and uh trying to achieve greater hop aroma intensity by just adding more and more and more hops is sort of like a it's, you just get incremental return right yes yeah. so you're spending more on raw materials you have increased beer losses and you have increased hop creep so all these things are working against you as a brewer and so trying to play within um a range that works um, from a, like an efficiency perspective um, is like sensible and something to take away. That's good. Yeah, I yeah we've definitely learned that as, as I think as we've matured as beer makers. You know, it's like if four pounds is good per barrel, then eight pounds eight must better. be good. <laughs> exactly right. You know? <laughs> and eight pounds per barrel, you're concentrating some pretty grody stuff. Really yeah. In my yeah. Experience. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. I, I was going to mention since I. I've kind of become like the just crash whenever the beer is ready to crash guy. Like there are definitely um, risks if you don't get yeast out of your package, um, you know, and I think it typically presents itself as diacetyly beers, but explosion risks are very real. So be careful um, if you, if you're going to crash a beer just because it's passing VDK doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to um, have no more fermentation potential. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I, you know, just if you don't have a centrifuge, I think you can cold crash a beer for a long time, maybe even find it. I know it's crazy for a hazy double IPA or something, but you can find a hazy IPA and still have it be quite hazy in my experience. Um, taking cell counts, you know, if you're worried about creep potential, um, you, you might even like do a little bottling off of a cold crash fermenter, put it in the boiler room or something and see if it develops to acetal it might be a good mm -hmm. little trick if you don't have a centrifuge. So, um, I don't know, just a couple thoughts and practical stuff to mm -hmm. stay out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Rob, any parting thoughts? Um, hopefully we'll solve it so perfectly that brewers will never even have to worry about it again. I like that. Oh, the smoking <laughs> gun really will be there. Yeah. 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 I think he's, it's a, I, I think you nailed it too. I mean, and I joke about being a hop vendor that wants people to use more hops. I do, but I want them to use them in judicious ways. I think three to five pounds per barrel is like a really nice sweet spot for modern beer production. Even two to five pounds per barrel, I think is like, you can get a lot out of that. When people ask us what the ideal hopping rate is, I, I usually throw out that number because I feel like there's a lot to be had there without, once again, concentrating some stuff that's mm -hmm. like, hops have a, a yin and yang to them, right? There's, right? there's good and bad in them, right? And so being able to, uh, to, to put the, the hops in their right format 
the right timing, all these other things can help them, you know, help help you extract more. It's a generalization as well. I'm sure there are some eight pound beers out there. Oh, that are, that are lovely ones. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, exactly. yeah, I haven't made one, but you know, yeah. I haven't tried many. Of yeah, yet, sure. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, all, uh, thank you guys for attending today for uh, helping the industry push this forward. I think it's one of those topics that really is evergreen. We never really kind of. It never gets stale because it's always present and brewers are always looking for more ways to help manage it. So we thank everybody out there for attending today and for attending uh, Hop and Brew School this year. We look forward to the chance uh, when we'll soon be able to be in front of you in person and to talk about hop creep and everything else that's related to hops and hoppy beer. And um, we hope that you guys have a great harvest season.